So today we're going to be doing Geography Now China, which that's a whole can of worms right there. China's confusing historically, geographically. It's incredibly complex and political today. I don't know how much of this may have aged poorly. A lot can happen in like a handful of years, so that disclaimer always comes right off the bat like if stuff has changed that is what it is like the video can only be judged for what it is in its own time it's a time capsule into china a few years ago uh china history is so weird because like it's always identified as china but it's a uh, a vastly different political entity from what it's been before like the united states i i feel like from the beginning to end of our history we've always sort of been kind of the same thing but china's gone through like different phases that are so very much distinct from one another that it's hard to judge all of china's history as one big thing which makes it very very complicated and, and you know when you're that old it, it's there, there's so many layers to it like that it's hard to follow so historically i find it difficult we'll see how geography goes there's like i said modern politics that are gonna come into play here almost certainly so let's get this started that's one of our, our answers.com Chungwa Hey, if anybody speaks Chinese, tell me if that was any good or not, because that th there does seem to be a bit of a turn here. Like the thumbnail like looks a little cleaner. The the filming oh is the intro different? It's time to learn geography. No, it's not. I don't know, just something looks cleaner. Did he render it at like a like at a higher quality? Because there's there's just something that looks a lot better about Oh, is this different? It might be different. Huh. Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbie. China, 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 or the People's Republic of China. Everybody knows something about this place and everybody has something to say about it. Now let's see what the flag has to say about itself. I like that he's wearing red. I wonder if that was on purpose. The flag is a simple red banner with five yellow stars in the upper hoist or canton corner, a large star surrounded by four smaller ones in a semicircular pattern to the right. According to the governmental interpretation, the red background symbolizes the revolution and the five stars were made yellow to radiate against the red. The stars represent unity mm. of the Chinese people under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. And just saying, you can't hate on uh, the Communist Party's ability to create strong symbols. The red and yellow looks pretty good they got a thing about putting things in corners i'm not huge into that but generally uh they they tend to have a pretty strong sense of aesthetic the larger star symbolizes the communist party of china and the four smaller stars that surround the big star symbolize the four social classes the working class the peasantry the urban petite bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie well that was pretty easy unfortunately that will be the only easy part of this video let's get messy in <laughs> Okay, geography peeps, get your popcorn and notebooks because this is where things are gonna get really complicated, messy, and dramatic and confusing. This is why I watch geography now. <laughs> First of all, mainland China is located in and dominates the heart of East Asia. At over 22,000 kilometers, it has the world's longest combined land border with 14 other countries. The country spans all the way from the Taklimakan Desert to the coast of Fujian. Depending on your method of measurement, China could either be the second, third, or fourth largest country in the world by total area. If you include mm. all the water territories, Canada is the second, even though China has slightly more landmass. And if you include Alaska, Hawaii, and all the official territories, the U.S. is slightly larger than China. But if China's disputed and confusing territories are all included, then China <laughs> is a little bit larger. Yeah, I know. It's only been a couple minutes, and I'm already making it look like... <laughs> yeah, well. Speaking of territories, let's stick our hands in the first layer. Let's be of real. China has some of the most complex administrative divisions in the world, and it all has to do with... He, he is being thoughtful on what how he approaches this he, he is doing a very good job at 
recognizing the layers to this. I think he knows with China, he has to be more careful with than most of the countries he's already done. Not because it's necessarily more important, although it is very important. It is certainly one of the more divisive to talk about right now so you you see that he's being a little bit more thoughtful with how he lays everything out I, and i can i kind of appreciate that effort. types of people and the rise of the 20th century first of all the country is divided into 22 official provinces but then we get to the subdivisions china also has five autonomous regions four municipalities and two special administrative regions that mostly self-govern themselves first let's talk about the autonomous regions they are guangxi tibet xinjiang ningxia and inner mongolia the strange thing is that each of these regions has incredibly distinct and contrasting cultural traits that differ from the rest of Han dominated Chinese culture. Because of the minority prevalency in these areas, they have kind of like a weird legislative membrane in which they are still under full sovereignty of China, but have extra special rights that don't apply to the rest of the provinces. Then we hit the municipalities. These are like the complete opposite of autonomous regions because they hold pretty much the highest governmental administrative classification in the country. And even though they are cities, they hold provincial status. In short, these guys are like the big shots of China and they are the capital mm. Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai and Chongqing. Yeah, trust those me. are all names I'd be familiar Beijing, with. Tianjin, Shanghai, Chongqing, Beijing, <laughs> Furthermore, we have two special administrative regions that kind of self-govern themselves, but they all kind of fall under Chinese sovereignty. They are Hong Kong and Macau. CGP Grey does an amazing video explaining the whole scenario on this, but I'll try to. Sum I'm surprised that the flag of the communist of a communist country would have any symbols of classes. I thought that they wanted to erase them. I think putting communism in like one box is difficult because and like I, f I think people have are under the impression that it's more unified as an ideology than it actually is <laughs> uh like i don't know if any other ideology gets that same sort of unified like that that false sense of unification like nearly as much as they do i i i, th I think there's just as much in fighting and like and it depends on like if you want something that would be like a pure communist or if you kind of fall under more communist or marxist principles which may not necessarily be law but may be like guiding i, I guess you could be communist more in principle and not have that necessarily reflect 100 percent in the way that you govern i i guess I don't know. It, it's weird. It's it's very very weird. Summarize it in the quickest way I can. These places used to be operated by the British and Portuguese until they were ceded back to China back in 1997 and 1999 respectively, and have a weird one country two systems policy. Even though it should be three systems, but hey, each of these areas has their own passports, currency, language, and even government. Mm. Then you have the strange six economic zones, which even though they do not have their own autonomy, they have flexible government regulation and free market policies that allow them to manage business transactions in a more liberal manner. These zones are cities along the coast and the entire island region of Hainan, otherwise known as the Hawaii of China. Ha, thought that the was Hawaii of China. Now things are gonna get really ugly. Now if there's one thing China knows how to do, it's getting people's attention. And not in a, hey guys, look at me, type of way, but more of like a, hey guys, look at me, kind of way. And one way they get attention is by making territory disputes. You don't wear horns on a helmet, really. Hey, hey, hey. It's called Chinese Taipei. Taiwan? is in a weird jurisdiction limbo with China because both sides kind of technically claim sovereignty over the other. As in, mainland China claims they own Taiwan, yet Taiwan believes ultimately that they are the sole proprietor of the entire mainland as well. It all had to do with the Chinese Civil War and the opposing That's political strange. Parties, yada, yada, yada. The Communist Party took over the mainland and the Nationalist Party took over Taiwan. Now we go inland. As That's we very confusing. In the Bhutan video, China has two disputed regions with them. Then we get to India. <laughs> Sometimes China and India are like two monstrous titans slamming into each other at high velocity. It's very difficult to really approach this. These are both two of the countries that have like one of the most, some of the most concentrated populations. So it's very interesting seeing them uh, clash. Uh, just, just like so much of the world is just contained within these two countries. I'm not gonna say most, but a lot. So I'm just I don't know the exact number. Simple claims as they stand and you make the decisions, okay? That way the worst that you can do is say, geography now, although not directly advocating, mentioned claims to one side of an argument that I do not agree with. 
In the east, we reach Arunachal Pradesh, which is to this day pretty much a state of India. However, China still believes it is part of South Tibet. In the Uttarakhand area by Tibet, you have the Niti Pass by Chamoli and the Valley of Jadganga. In Pradesh, you have the Rayo Purgil Mountains and the Spiti River Valley. And finally, we reach Jammu and Kashmir, aka the most messed up no man's land in the entire planet. Here, China lays claim to the Shaksgam Valley, the Fukche Valley, the mouth of the river by Chumar, and the largest mm. chunk of highlands, the Aksai Chin region, which Chinese National Highway 219 passes through. In addition, further up north, pretty much all of Tajikistan's southeast border with China is disputed. <sighs> And then we reach the Spratly Islands. Spratly oh, jeez. Um, so China's like naval policy is very complicated, and I have I've always had such a hard time understanding that. Are the Spratly Islands like the man-made islands, or is that a different thing we're talking about? Islands. Who will own you now? I don't no, know. No, no, these aren't the man-made islands. I know they have like I. I believe it's a policy where they create like these man-made islands that help them claim more international water because when it comes to claiming international water it, it's like a certain distance out from the coast but if you add additional islands then you have further claim but I don't think this is that I think that's another thing in the South China Sea, things get really messy. Imagine, if you will, a bunch of people walking towards each other, each one on their phones, looking at pictures of Bob Saget, and then suddenly they all bump into each other and notice a pile of money on the ground right at their feet. They drop their phones and immediately lunge for the pile, disagreeing on whose money is whose and how much belongs to which person. That's the Spratly Islands. Essentially, these islands are claimed by five separate countries in the area, six if you consider Taiwan sovereign, and the whole deal is just an enormous mess of convoluted claim squabbling. This is what the Philippines claims, this is Vietnam's, Brunei's, Malaysia's, and I've seen kind of does this. this. Basically, the are <laughs> I've seen that little layout. Royale, and when one side doesn't really pay attention to one island that they claim, another side sweeps in and builds a military station. It gets ugly sometimes. Oh yeah, and there's a cluster of rocks called the Diaoyu or the Senkaku Islands that both China and Japan both think is theirs. All right, that's it. Kind of. I mean, we didn't really talk about the whole North Korea thing and how the entire country operates under one time zone, but we'll just have to save that for a social media comment war. That's meantime, weird. We gotta get this gravy train rolling. I cut it. So time zones are kind of... I could see that working fine. Well, it's a, re it's a really big country to operate under one time zone. So I guess different times would have different implications depending on where you are. Uh, even though it's like, like if you're calling your, uh, your friend who's on the other side of China, you're going to have to like, you they'd think of time differently although you'd be using the same number like that's not too insane i i i could see that working it just feels a little messy China is a big, big country, so naturally you're gonna get deep geographic divisions all over, but in general, if you look at China from space, you'll notice that the east is significantly greener than that of the arid, rocky north and west. Situated right on the eastern third of the Eurasian landmass, China's inner and coastal domain is kind of shielded by the arid, sparsely populated highlands in the southwest, west, and north, encapsulating the fertile lowlands inside. I like to call this the Chinese shield. Nobody's gonna touch my plants. This is partially why it took Europeans so long to develop solid ties and interactions with the Okay, that's funny. Sure, the Silk Road had existed for centuries prior, but crossing all the mountains and deserts and rocky paths was less favorable to sea exploration for them. And by the way, no, Marco Polo did not bring the concept of pasta to Italy by bringing back Chinese noodles from his travels. Pasta had already existed in the Mediterranean for centuries prior to the excursion. Okay. China has a vast domain of biodiversity and climate. I didn't know that was a claim I, I i know there's a lot of false claims about marco polo i didn't know about the pasta one i assume that's just popular because it's italy pasta 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 pizza pasta the west yeah, and north will be radically different from the coast and south so let's start was that offensive i'm sorry <laughs> with the inland and coast. On the east side of China and the coasts, you have the heavily populated alluvial plains that are generally flat with numerous spots for shipping and harbors and beaches with the cool looking ones like Panjin Red Beach that blossoms every autumn. Oh. Up to the provinces of Jilin. And Dude, like hold Panjin on. Red... That's real? Hold on. Well, I I can do it this way. Um, I, I, I need to take a look at that what red beach china 
I want to take a look at more pictures of this place. Okay. I'll pull it up so you can see what I'm looking at. How is that even? Okay. Oh, here, here's the Wikipedia article. That, that's really interesting. Okay. The sueda is one of the few species of plants that can live highly alkaline in ha alkaline soil. Its growth cycle starts in April with a colored light red, while the color of the mature species is a deep red. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. It's fast fascinating indeed. All right. Uh, hold on. Let let me get us back to where we were before. <laughs> I apologize for the uh, diversion. You must cease. You're crazy. You crazy. You must go right here. At least if I place you there. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I had to at least place him in a way where there's something between him and the microphone. So he's at least a little quieter if he proceeds to scream. <laughs> All right. Let's continue whatever we were doing. What were we doing? That blossoms every autumn. Head a little bit north up to the provinces of Jilin and Heilongjiang and half of Inner Mongolia along the borders of Russia and North Korea and you hit the coldest spot in all of China. In fact, every year the city of Harbin, named the Ice City, has a huge ice sculpting festival that draws in millions of tourists in the winter months. Fun fact, this general area of China was commonly referred to as Manchuria in the past, named after the Manchu people, which is where the Fu Manchu mustache gets its name from, which is where I get oh. this video. Head a little east and you reach the rest of the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region, which is dominated by the Mongolian Plateau, which is a highland consisting of dry steppes, hills, and yes, the Gobi Desert. Which, fun side note, is where all those beautiful caravan raiding and give me back my comb or I will kill you chasing scenes from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon were filmed. Head a little west and things get a little more intense. Congratulations, you've reached the largest subdivision in China, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Oh this is gosh. The we're gonna talk about the Uyghurs. Um, this has only gotten more contentious since this video came out, so I'm curious to how he's going to handle this. Wild west of China. At over one and a half million square kilometers, only about 5% of the area is fit for human habitation. This area is strange, rocky, rugged, mountainous, and loaded with oil, making it China's largest gas producing region. Then you head a little south and you reach the strange Taklamakan Desert, or the Cold Desert. This huge basin of shifting sand dunes is almost completely surrounded by the snow capped mountains trapping in the. This is probably just going to talk about the physical place i'd imagine the actual uyghur stuff is going to be in demographics so we'll we, we don't have to talk about that for a minute that that's that's oh oh you're not sorry i didn't realize you weren't pulled up on screen here we go there we go. My bad. It wins. However, it still lies in the rain shadow. You didn't miss much. Don't so worry. It barely receives any precipitation. However, the funny thing is, if you look closely, you can see the ice melt from the Tian Shan and Kunlun Mountains in the north and south, feeding into the valleys below by the desert until they create a dry riverbed that looks like a strange Angelina Jolie forehead vein in the desert. <laughs> Head south, and then we reach the most notable autonomous region, the Tibetan Plateau. As the highest region on Earth with an average elevation of nearly 5,000 meters, 16,000 feet, this area is situated on the Himalayan mountains, the tallest mountain range on the planet, and the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, straddles the border with Nepal. The funny thing is, the Tibetan Plateau, and to some extent the Qinghai province, is so high that the snowmelt runoff doesn't really have much to go in the arid north. So it just kind of flows into the empty crevices, creating China's largest network of freshwater lakes, speckled throughout the entire area, including the largest lake in China, Qinghai Lake. Many speculate that these are actually the sources of many of the major rivers in China, including the Yellow and Yangtze. Then we get mm. to the southeast by the provinces of Yunnan, Guangxi, and Guangdong as the warmest regions in the country. These areas are home to some of the most picturesque rock forest and eroded mountain landscapes with the terraced rice paddies that have literally usurped the entire surface area of hills and mountains. This is also the only place where you can find the creepy snub-nosed monkey. Oh. You head inland, you reach the rural areas, and you can encounter the vast network of rivers and creeks that irrigate the Can't show something like that. that never end with the occasional pine and bam a warning here's where we have to address a little bit of reality yes china is loaded with beautiful scenery unmatched anywhere else in the world i mean the setting for avatar was inspired by the jiang jiajian national park however just like any other major state they do have their land controversies china has been trying really hard to crack down on its poaching and especially against the endangered species like the black neck crane the golden monkey and of course the iconic mascot of the nation the giant panda bear and on top of mm. that china has quite a pollution problem the chinese ministry of health has stated that industrial pollution has made cancer China's leading cause of death. This is both attributed to the air and land pollution. They've tried their... 
I'm not surprised that China of all places would have this problem with the this happens often worse in places where there are massive population concentrations as well so I, I I know that's not the only factor there but considering how big their population is you you would uh, it, it's it's pretty easy to understand how it is part of the problem their best to combat the issue with instituting strict regulations on fines and bans but with the population as big as china it's proven incredibly difficult to manage contamination maintenance now not saying that the people themselves do it it's often like big companies and stuff that end up causing a lot of pollution but y you know what i'm saying it tends to happen in more urbanized places let's talk about the most controversial aspect of china the demographics I knew this was gonna happen, All right, here we go. I'm probably but I'm not gonna ready. Nervous until we get to the Israel video or the country that must not be named. Let's talk about the people of China. With a population of around 1.4 billion people, China is the world's most populous country with around 19% of the entire world's population. About one out of every five people on the planet is Chinese. Let me just emphasize exactly how big that is. In China, they have traffic jams that can last not only hours, but days on 50 lane highways. In China, even if you are one in a million, there are still 1,400 people exactly just like you. But my mom, <laughs> think I'm cool. Okay, that's great. Seriously though, China is packed. However, with the colossal population comes an endlessly broad spectrum of culture, traditions, people groups, customs, and lifestyles. China officially recognizes about 56 different ethnic people groups that inhabit the entire country. At about 90%, the largest majority of the population identifies as Han Chinese, and the remainder of the population typically falls within one of the many ethnic groups and the subdivision groups. The largest ones being the Zhuang. I think that's one of the more lopsided bits of uh one of the more lopsided demographic pie charts that we've seen so far in this series usually it's broken down a little bit more than this before we end up getting to the other category so that's kind of interesting that it's like so overwhelmingly one thing population typically falls within one of the many ethnic groups and the subdivision groups. The largest ones being the Zhuang, the Hui, the Manchu, and the Uyghur. Funny little side note, there are actually about twice as many Mongols living in China than there are actually in Mongolia itself. The interesting thing is that they actually write in the traditional vertical Mongol script that has all but been abandoned from regular Mongolia since the introduction of the Cyrillic alphabet in the 40s. You can even mm. find the traditional characters on street signs and stores in the region. When it comes to the population, you need to know about the imaginary Heihe Tengchong line. This is a line drawn diagonally from the northern city of Heihe all the way to Tengchang in the south, and about 94% of the entire country's population lives east of this line. The official language of China is Mandarin or Putonghua. However, like mentioned before, regional languages exist and they're even allowed to publish and utilize their own scripts in public. You can find the largest linguistic oh, contest in the autonomous regions. The I'm glad that they're allowed. The Guangxi autonomous region and is actually closer to the Thai and Lao languages with some mutual understanding. The only problem is that it's written in the Latin alphabet. Just like we mentioned in the Bhutan video, the Tibetan language is closer to the Bhutanese Dzonga language and is written with the Tibetan syllabary, which is actually closer to the scripts found in India and Nepal. The Uyghurs of mm. the north write in an Arabic-based writing system, and it's crazy because these people are actually the least Chinese-looking people in all of China, as they are... This is... Oh, that's a white guy. <laughs> I'm kidding. Turkic in their heritage, yet they still have... I, I, but, like... Because these people are actually the least Chinese... I'm, I'm kind of kidding. In China, as they are... And it looks like a white guy with a sunburn. Uh, that guy in the middle. As far as the other people go, I, uh, it's harder to tell. Yet they still have Chinese citizenship, and most are able to at least hold a conversation in Mandarin as a second language. Then, of course, we get to one of the most widely known dialects, Cantonese, spoken mostly in the south in the Guangdong province, as well as Hong Kong and Macau, propagated worldwide through the help of famous Hong Kong cinema and television. One thing you need to understand is that many of these dialects are completely unintelligible to Mandarin. For example, in Mandarin, you might say, but in Cantonese, you would say, in Mandarin, Xi but in Cantonese, Hai See, they don't sound anything alike. Well, they don't sound like no nothing to me either way, so it don't matter to me. <laughs> Here, go, go play with this ball. The Didn't even get a cowboy hat for that one. Writing system, so even if you don't understand each other, you can still communicate with writing. Fun little side note, the same thing even sometimes applies for Japan as they use the kanji writing system, which is made up of Chinese characters all over. Culture-wise, there is too much to cover and I won't be able to address everything, but basically the Chinese have an incredibly long history of vibrant, exuberating customs, traditions, rituals, dynasties, discoveries, inventions, wars, alliances, art, building, food, apparel, policies, and beliefs. And the list goes on and on. To even attempt to scratch the surface, we would have to make over 100 episodes. One thing that mm. kind of is universal, though, is that 
the Chinese have a very hardworking, diligent type of social construct that looms over the entire population. Students can typically spend about 12 hours a day on schoolwork and studying in order to pass college entrance exams, which is a huge deal. Oh, and they absolutely yeah. love practicing English. In fact, there are actually more people in China that speak English as a second language than there are in the UK. Some children that show signs of being gifted in certain academic, athletic, and artistic prowess are even selected by the state to undergo training at specific academies that cater towards targeting on honing those skills. Speaking of which, the country operates under a one-party socialist state. But I thought China was communist! Eh, not really. I mean, yes, the ruling party is called the Communist Party, and they do endorse some of the democratic centralist principles that Lenin proposed, and they do advocate some semi-communist ideologies, but in all reasonable definitions, China is not a full-on communist country. After the seven- There's actually very few... I don't... I, it's hard to even think of an example of a place that actually has done, like, full-on, 100% unfiltered, like, stateless communism, like, as Lenin would have seen it or whatever. I, I don't know. Like, th the ideal is just that. It's an ideal. We've not actually seen, like, a fulfilled communist destiny or whatever, whatever they you want to call it. I, I don't know. We, we've not seen that. So to put people under most countries under just like a flat communist umbrella doesn't necessarily do their description justice it, it doesn't tell you much these policies were relaxed and China opened up a more free market economy. Nonetheless, there are still restrictions on press, access to the internet, although VPNs and proxy servers are not uncommon to avoid that problem, freedom of assembly, nice. and even freedom of religion. Speaking of which, China has an interesting faith-based background. Although most people in the country are generally irreligious or adhere to traditional faiths and ideologies like Confucianism and Taoism, there are... So the, that's one of those things that comes for... The, the being irreligious, the, that could have been largely influenced by... Uh, having kind of those Marxist pr principles sort of being at the forefront for so long. I don't, I don't know what it would have been like before, like it, maybe in the 19th century. I'm sure it's moved very much in that direction since the 19th century still a surprisingly solid community of people that have faith backgrounds. Islam can be mostly found in the West in the Xinjiang and Ningxia areas. Buddhism is more prevalent in the South where you can find massive Buddha statues like the ones carved in the cliff of Leshan. But then you get this weird anomaly and realize there is a huge influx of Christians that suddenly just came out of nowhere. China has the world's fastest growing Christian population and demographers speculate that somewhere around 150 to 200 million people identify as Christians in China. It is soon projected that in less than 15 years, China will be the world's largest Christian nation. Sociologists attribute this sudden rapid that's crazy version since the previously instated one child policy discredits the possibility of big families speaking of which that whole one child policy thing was revoked in 2015 and now they have a two child policy in a nutshell, <laughs> when it comes to people china they still do have a child policy though they they restrict whether or not you can they, they, they restrict the amount of children you can have which in the west we see as like totally crazy but they have a legitimate problem like they're, they 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 have like population issues that in the united states we probably couldn't quite relate to it doesn't mean we gotta like it but we can kind of understand like that there are there are layers to this that are a little bit uh it's it's, it's a little more complex than that China is a colossal behemoth to be reckoned with. You can't deny that China sticks out like a sore thumb on the world stage. Now let's see what role they play on that stage. Oh god, here's where it becomes a mess, isn't it? Okay, so here's the deal. We all know that China we, we didn't really touch upon the Uyghurs. I don't know if that's going to come into play here. It might come into play in the international stuff. Maybe. But I, I thought we were going to get into it more. Like I said, it's become more of an issue over time so maybe i don't know if it was as big of an issue when this or as big of as talked about when this video came out so i don't know huge in terms of nominal gdp china has the second largest economy in the world after the u.s they are the world's largest exporter trade nation oil importer and henceforth it's not hard to really conclude that china has a lot of connections china has diplomatic relations with almost every single country in the world minus a few that either never really had the time to meet up or the few that recognize taiwan's sovereignty over the people's republic which doesn't really sit well with them nonetheless trying to analyze china's diplomatic relations is like one big messed up chess game that makes no sense one thing that we can start with is the BRICS nations BRICS being the acronym 
Forum for the Association of the Five National Emerging Economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These five countries have developed- Since last year, there's a three-child policy. Oh, cool. <laughs> an alliance based on bilateral- I didn't know about that one. And mutual benefit agreements. One misconception- so It's improving, I suppose. And India do not get along. Yes, in the 60s, there was a Sino-Indian war, and yes, the border disputes are all kind of still in effect, but nonetheless, China and India have been operating in diplomatic measures for decades. They are heavily dependent on each other's trade and business, and after a few high-level visits from the former president, Jiang Zemin, in the 90s, tensions have eased off quite a bit. The only problem is that both countries are the biggest investors in Africa, so that kind of puts a little bit of competition in the bucket. When it comes to Africa, China China was kind of like, uh, Africa is like a really big place with a lot of stuff we could use with a lot of diplomatic confusion. So, uh, maybe we should step in as the new guys and cut a deal with these Africans. That, to this day, China has really- That's smart. Africa, it, it is one of the fastest developing places in the world. It has tons of natural resources. It's going to be huge on the world stage over the next century. So, China's wise to get involved there. Uh, I know there's like- they're working to build African infrastructure, which it kind of comes in like a Chinese policy of, I, I use the term colonization through debt, which maybe is the more cynical framing of it. But yeah, you putting a lot of these countries in debt to you kind of ties them to you in a lot of ways and can be advantageous. Kind of has the money to lend or the resources uh to improve a country's infrastructure they're smart to do it that way it feels kind of evil but it they're you know these these countries have their autonomy to make that decision i suppose been keeping their eyes on sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in places like South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Angola. South Africa and Angola being the largest African trading partners with China. The problem though is that China is kind of far and doesn't really have a coast on the Indian Ocean for shipment from Africa, so that's where Pakistan comes in. Pakistan has hey. actually been one of the closest friends and allies of China since the beginning of the economic reform period. Not only do they offer China access to the Indian Ocean from the ports of Gwadar, they frequently collaborate on energy, technology, and even military agreements, which kind of makes sense in case of tensions ever rolls with India ever again. Funny enough, Israel is also a close ally of China as well. During World War II, Shanghai took in many Jewish refugees, and Israel was the first country in the Middle East to recognize the PRC as the legitimate government of China. Which is weird because China also has ties to Iran and many other nations in the Middle East that could care less for Israel. In fact, trade between China and the Middle East goes way back millennia all the way to the Silk Road, so it's nothing new for them. Russia is probably the closest European- Equals debt trapping and taking action against it. Yeah. It doesn't feel good, does it? Like, there- is a certain degree where like i like that a lot of these countries can have their infrastructure uh modernized there there's elements of that that could be advantageous but there's always going to be like like nobody does anything for free on the world stage we we kind of just have to be able to accept that an ally, even though the Sino-Soviet split in the 60s kind of caused a little bit of dissension. It's gonna be a little cynical. To have learned to kind of shrug it off and join forces again. Russia to this day is also the largest oil exporter to China, and there's even a small community of Russians living in China, mostly in Harbin in the north. Which is weird again, because China's relations with the US are pretty crucial too. The US is China's largest trade partner and plays a pivotal role in China's revenue input. They are friends with both North and South Korea. However, with all the nuke action going on, China has been less and less supportive of North Korea and has even threatened to impose sanctions against them. And that's not even happen mm. if you want the whole story go talk to a chinese person because we are out of time in conclusion since the beginning of its conception china has always been yeah. able to show the world that it knows how to make you know about it and now that you know about it you have no idea how much you still need to know stay tuned and come be uh with columbia no that try you tried hey okay. jack so yeah next time we're gonna do columbia um you know, I think he did the best he could in less than 20 minutes. There are some things that, of course, it would be nice if he could bring up. But there, there's also like, I, he seems to be doing sort of the less offensive side of the geography stuff while still addressing some of the problems. Uh, I think about the Uyghur Muslims and like the uh, the concentration camps. And when I say concentration camp, I don't want you to immediately think death camp. But I do want you to take like some negative connotation to that because yeah, there are there are a lot of like there's a culture of like re-education camps over there, which of course that's incredibly troubling. And it's one of those things you want them to bring up, but 
Also, there's a lot of things that I could probably be like, well, why didn't you talk about this? Why didn't you talk about that? It, it's 20 minutes. I get it. That, that's totally fine. Uh, overall, that was one of the more interesting Geography Now ones we've checked out. And I think it's given us a little bit of an idea of where the series is going. Uh, like, we've seen him change a lot since the beginning. We've been watching since Afghanistan, just going down al alphabetically. And it's been quite the journey. So, like, it, it's really cool seeing this one that really feels like uh, it's actually taking a step in the direction of being more like his current stuff, which looks a lot cleaner. That's cool. That's cool seeing all that because of demonetization. He got demonetized in the New Zealand episode for talking about a massacre for five seconds. Oh, geez. That's not surprising at all, but oh, geez, that sucks. Yeah, China's probably a bit sensitive about certain subjects like that. I mean, you can get demonetized in like one country rather than getting demonetized everywhere, but um, uh, China's probably a valuable place. You wouldn't want to lose your monetization, but you also want to be able to talk about this stuff. Like sometimes you got to risk that stuff by bringing up whatever. I've been demonetized in a lot of places. <laughs> um, uh, it just depends on the subject, I suppose.